Good evening, and welcome to our time of worship. Let me open with a word of prayer. Visit this place, O Lord, we pray. And drive far from it the snares of the enemy. May your holy angels dwell with us and guard us in peace. And may your blessing be always upon us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. I invite you to join in a moment's prayer as we offer our prayers to Almighty God. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have made us for yourself. And our hearts are restless till they find their rest in you. Pour out your love into our hearts and draw us to yourself. And so bring us at last to your heavenly city when we shall see you face to face. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. And Lord God, as we gather at the end of another Sunday, 
at the end of another week. We have a moment of silence as we reflect upon this past day and this past week, as we remember the good and the bad. Most merciful God, we confess to you before the whole company of heaven and one another that we have sinned in thought, word and deed and in what we have failed to do. Forgive us our sins, heal us by your Spirit and raise us to new life. In Jesus Christ, who taught us these words to pray. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our first reading is from Exodus chapter 17, reading from verse 1. The whole Israelite community set out from the desert of Sin, travelling from place to place as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. So they quarrelled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Moses replied, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? But the people were thirsty for water there, and they grumbled against Moses. They said, Why do you bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, What am I to do with these people? They're almost ready to stone me. The Lord answered Moses, Go out in front of the people. Take with you some of the elders of Israel and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will stand there before you by the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the place Massa and Merhal because the Israelites quarreled and because they attested the Lord saying, Is the Lord among us or not? A New Testament reading is from Luke chapter 12, beginning to read at verse 22. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothes. Consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable you are than birds. Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to your life? Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? Consider how the wild flowers grow. They do not labour or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendour was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today, and tomorrow is thrown into the fire. How much more will he clothe you, you of little faith? Do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it. For the pagan world runs after all such things, and your father knows that you need them. But seek his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out. A treasure in heaven that will never fail, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Amen. We're going to look at Luke chapter 12 the 12th chapter of the third gospel in the bible 
the third account, Luke's account of the life of Jesus Christ, the good news of Jesus Christ. And so we're going to look at Luke chapter 12 from verses 22 to 34. And whenever I read these words, I'm sure just like you as well, a song always comes to mind. It's a dire straight song. And maybe it's one that Gordon can play the guitar for. And it kind of goes something like... Why worry? There should be laughter after pain. There should be sunshine after rain. These things have always been the same. So why worry now? Why worry now? Now, something like 2,000 years before Mark Knopfler and Dire Straits wrote those words, Jesus asked a similar question, why worry? And he didn't talk about sunshine and rain, he talked about birds and flowers. And Jesus' answer to the question, why worry, is don't worry. Trust in God. If you put your focus on God, he will look after you. So why worry? So what we'll do is we'll start by just giving a bit of the background. And as people who were in the morning service will know, we're covering the part of the account that Elisa and Heather read so wonderfully this morning. And then we'll look through this passage. And really, because the teaching is so clear and so wonderful, that all I can do is kind of lead us through it, add a bit of colour and kind of stay out the way so that you really just hear this wonderful, clear teaching of Jesus Christ. So let me say a word of prayer. May the words of my mouth and the thoughts of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So a reminder that these words that we heard that David read are... With And we know that from the beginning of chapter 12, that Jesus is sharing these words with thousands of people. There's literally thousands of people around him. And in fact, it says that the people are trampling on each other. So it's a a rowdy crowd. It's a kind of gathering of thousands, several thousand people gathered, many thousands it says, gathered around Jesus Christ. And it says that Jesus then begins to speak first to his disciples. Now, Wiser experts than me tell me that in the Greek, the word for disciples used here is different. You know how Jesus, we often assume that Jesus is speaking to his 12 disciples. But here the the word's different in the original. This is more like learners. So it's not necessarily just the 12 disciples that Jesus is speaking to. It's really saying out of this thousands of people, many of them are by now in the time of Jesus are hostile. They, they've swallowed the words of the Pharisees and others that, that Jesus isn't right, that Jesus is from Satan, that they've, they've allowed themselves not to believe the good news of Jesus. So many thousands are struggling. But in amongst them, and Jesus calls them in this passage a little flock. It's a lovely expression. In amongst the many thousands of people listening, there are those disciples. And, and the Greek word, another way of saying it is learners. Those who are still trying to understand still giving Jesus a chance, still listening, not accepting the words of the Pharisees and others. And it says out of the many thousands that are there, it's those that Jesus now speaks to. And we can read that Jesus is saying many, many important things to these people, many vital things in the first 12 verses of chapter 12. He's telling them, don't be afraid of those who can kill the body, can do no more. God has numbered every hair on your head. And he says that even if your trust in me leads to problems, even if you are brought in front of the synagogue, the rulers, the authorities, then I'll tell you the right things to say. And in amongst all these powerful things, as we knew from this morning, someone interrupts and says, teacher. Tell my brother to share. Tell my brother to share his inheritance. So in amongst these life-changing words, there's someone who's just waiting for the moment to get in there and say, look, tell my brother to share. Probably pointing at him. Tell my brother to share with me. Tell my brother to share the inheritance. 
And from that, Jesus warns, because he can see what's behind the question, he warns against greed, that life isn't about the abundance of possessions. And so Jesus tells the, the story, a parable, and just the sheer amazingness of Jesus. This all comes from an interruption. Our whole where we're going tonight comes from an interruption. And yet as Jesus is interrupted, he just has a parable to emphasize the point to this person who said, tell, tell my brother to share his inheritance with me. And Jesus, of course, tells the story of the rich farmer who gets an unexpectedly good harvest, decides that he's set by himself, he doesn't need to share with others, and he's set for many years to come. And in this story, God says to the man, you're a fool. Your life will be taken this very night and you will not get all that you prepared. And this is how it is, Jesus says, for those who store things up for themselves here on earth, but are not rich towards God. Life, he says, does not just consist of only of now, does not consist of all you can get for yourself now. Real life consists in your generosity towards God and towards others. Store up treasures in heaven. And then we join the story in verse 22, which is where David started reading tonight. And the first word, that Jesus now still says to this group, this little flock, these disciples, is therefore. So it all kind of follows on. So think about, store up riches with God. Focus on God. Focus on the kingdom. Not on building up treasures for yourself here in life. Therefore. And Jesus starts this teaching that we read tonight. Therefore, Jesus says in verse 22, because of what I've showed you in response to this interruption, Jesus says, do not worry about your life now. Do not worry about what you'll eat or about your body or what you will wear. For life, as I have just shown, is more than food and the body is more than clothes. And this is again to these disciples, these learners who have shown an interest. He's speaking here to those who are taking steps, tentative steps perhaps, towards putting their trust in Jesus. And it is those, he realises, who, like so many of us, get overwhelmed sometimes by worrying and anxiety. We know it's not right. We know it's not trusting God. But we can't help ourselves. But Jesus Christ, who loves us, knows that the worrying robs us of joy, robs us of so many of the wonderful things he wishes to give us. So he says, don't worry about your life now what you eat, about your body, what you will wear. And so Jesus asks those who worry to think a bit now. He says, don't worry. Think. Consider, he says. Consider the ravens. And I love the way the mind of Jesus Christ works, that it must be so hard to keep up with them. We're, we're saying, don't worry. Okay, don't worry, that's incredible. Consider the ravens. The what? Consider the ravens. And so you ask them to look up. Consider the ravens. And he says, consider the ravens, the birds in the air. They don't sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn. Yet God feeds them. God just feeds them. We've spoken before in this church about the, the sheer pleasure that creation gives God. There's so much a creation is just for God's pleasure. It reflects the glory of God. And those wonderful, miraculous animals that stay up in the air by flapping their wings and soaring. These birds of the air that I see out of the window as I prepared this sermon, just getting on with their lives, are there for God's pleasure, God's delight. God sees them and God feeds them. These birds don't shop, whether online or in person. They don't cook. They don't refrigerate. They're out of our sight most of the time. And yet they are provided for day by day by day. So God says, don't worry about what you eat. Look at the ravens. Look at how I look after them. And if God provides, Jesus says, every day as he sees fit for the birds of the air, then how much more valuable are we than these birds? If God does this all for these birds, 
then what on earth will he do for us? So why worry? And how much more valuable are we than the ravens, than the birds of the air? Well, we know it. We know from the Bible, the very beginning of the Bible, Genesis 1. The birds of the air are created on the fourth day, it says. And on the fifth day, God says, and God says, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the birds in the sky. Or in Genesis 2, the account of Adam and Eve, Lord God, who formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky, brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. Jesus is saying to these learners, these disciples, saying to us, these stresses we have about day-to-day life, about our life now, trust God. Look up. Look at the birds that fly through the vista. God provides for them. And if he provides for them, he will provide for you. As the Bible tells us, we are more valuable than the birds. So don't worry about these things, Jesus says. Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your life? Now, some of you may have translations that say it differently. They may well say, who can add a single cubit to their height? A cubit being about 18 inches. Um, about the kind of size of the, the part that Bob McIntyre missed tonight? No. It, only that's for the Ryder Cup folk. But so who can add a cubit to their height as well? Or who can add a single hour to their life? Can you do this by worrying? I love this. That just hints that this thing that Jesus calls simple, just adding an hour to your life or a, or, or a foot and a half to your height, something that would be so simple for God is of course impossible for us. Jesus says, if you cannot even do this little thing, why do you worry about the rest? Mark Twain, the author of The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, amongst others, once said, I'm an old man, and I've known a great many troubles, but most of them never happened. I've known a great many troubles, but most of them never happened. Why worry? Why worry? And it seems that Jesus is just, he's still going along and people are trying to keep up with him because he's saying, look, look up there at the birds, consider the birds, okay, we're considering the birds. Now look down, okay, look down and consider the wild flowers. Consider the wild flowers. Consider the lilies or the wild flowers, he says. They don't labour or spin. How appropriate indeed for this part of the country with our mills and our Harriet Watt textile students. Consider the wild flowers. They don't labour or spin. But not even Solomon, in all his splendour, was dressed like just one of these wild flowers. And how well dressed was Solomon in the Bible, I hear you ask? Well, I can't find a quote, but I'll give you a quote that gives us some idea of the kind of splendour that Solomon lived in. This is the king, King Solomon, it says, made a great throne covered with ivory, and overlaid with fine gold. The throne had six steps, and its back had a rounded top. On both sides of the seat were armrests, with a lion standing beside each of them. Twelve lions stood in the six steps, one on either end of each step. Nothing like it had ever been made for any other kingdom. All King Solomon's goblets, it says, were gold, and all the household articles were pure gold. Nothing was made of silver, silver was considered of little value in Solomon's days. And Jesus is saying, we have never, we've never, no human being has ever managed to dress themselves as well as that. But look at what God could do to a wildflower. Look at what God can do with a wildflower. That's the best example you humans can do. But that's nothing compared to how God can dress even the wildflower, the grasses of the field. That are here today and on the fire tomorrow, he says. And the, for the people listening, this would have made a lot of sense. Because they cooked on fires. And to regulate the temperature of the fire, they would use the dry grass. So they'd use the dry grass in the fire to regulate the temperature. To get to the right temperature for whatever they were cooking. And so they'd understand this. That this wild flower, which if you went with a microscope to it, it's utterly beautiful, utterly detailed. 
and, and Jesus is saying, look at that. That's what God can make. And that's just lobbed in a fire tomorrow. So if God does that for a wild flower, how much more will he clothe you? Oh, you of little faith, he says, to those of us who worry. You disciples, he says, you who are trying to learn from me. The world outside, he says, the pagan world, they focus on these things, on what you eat and you drink. But your father, your father in heaven who delights in you, who created you, who numbers the hair on your head, who is therefore never going to forget you, knows that you need these things. So don't worry about them. And we can begin to see where Jesus is going with this, where he's telling us the solution to worry is coming from. Seek God's kingdom. Put your trust in God. If you put your trust in God, Jesus is saying, not only will you have the most precious peril, the greatest gift, the reassurance of God with you now and forever, a peace that passes all understanding, the Holy Spirit within you, the joy, the joy that comes from knowing Jesus Christ, not only that, But the things you spend so much time worrying about will be given to you as well. Seek first the kingdom of God and then the rest shall be given unto you. So Jesus says, don't be afraid, little flock. That lovely expression to those, the group who are holding on with, in that crowd of thousands. Don't be afraid, little flock. Don't be afraid. Because there's yet more. He's saying, don't just worry about things in this life, but don't also worry about the life to come as well. Don't worry about your spiritual life either. Don't be afraid about what happens even after you die. If you seek the kingdom, if you seek God, then your Father in heaven will be pleased to give you the kingdom. It gives him pleasure to give you the kingdom. If it gives God so much pleasure to feed the birds, to put so much detail into temporary grass, then how much pleasure will it give him to give you eternal life? And so because of this, because of this, Jesus says, because you don't need to worry about things in this life, because you don't need to worry about eternal life, Jesus says, Live your life now giving. Live a life now of extraordinary generosity because it's raven's food compared to how generous God will be to you. Get rid of the things you can get rid of. Give to the poor. For if seeking the kingdom is the way towards not worrying, then it's made easier when you focus on being rich towards God. Because by doing this, you're providing a purse for yourselves that won't wear out. You're providing a treasure in heaven that will never fail. And this helps you avoid you being greedy. And it helps stop you worrying about the things in life. Because Jesus says, where your heart is, where your treasure is, sorry, there your heart will be also. So when we're worried... When we're worried and about the day-to-day -day things in life, look up at the birds in the air. When anxiety about life now comes to us, consider the wild flowers. When we worry about what the future may hold, remember that God delights to give you the whole kingdom. And you can't get any more than that. So seek God. Live generously. And this will give you the answer to the question, why worry? I started with a song. And I'll finish with a poem. It's a very short poem, written something like 160 years ago. And it's called Overheard in an Orchard. Said the robin to the sparrow, I should really like to know why these anxious human beings rush about and worry so. Said the sparrow to the robin, 
friend, I think that it must be. That they have no heavenly father, such as cares for you and me. Lord God, thank you for this time together. Thank you for bringing us together. Thank you for friends here. For people we know and are getting to know. Help us to grow together as a community here in Gala Shields. To love you and to serve you. And to support each other and show each other friendship. Lord God, we pray for those we know who are going through difficult times at the moment. We pray for John. 
and Nancy and Elizabeth and Eleanor and Lillian. And we pray for those who haven't been mentioned, but those who we are thinking about this night. Lord God, we ask your blessing upon the guild over the coming year. And the girls' brigade. And as we think this night of our world, of our friends, our family, as we think about the week ahead, in the quiet we bring you our own prayers. Lord God, we ask that you hear these prayers. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.